And then and how long you're about to hear it. You're going to have to hear the very condensed version. Ah. <laughs> it's the 15 second how I got here. Very nice. Let's just get it started. Uh. All right. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, very quick introduction of what we're going to do here. Uh, my name is Eva Scarza. I am a faculty member here at uh, HBS. I'm in the marketing department. I think it's the first one that you have that is in operations. So I'm in marketing. Uh, I do a lot of work on data-driven marketing, how to help organizations effectively use this customer data, which is something that is very hard at the mission of our customer intelligence lab, which is one, I'm one of the co-PIs. Uh, we do that with uh, um, the idea is to develop research that helps company leverage the data in a responsible manner. And that's why this gets very at the heart of what we're doing in this uh, catalyst this week. So today, in this session, we're going to talk about intended consequences. There's been some talk about that already. So there is a lot of com conversations that will come and go. Uh, and I have a great, diverse panel here today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a minute for each of them to tell you who they are, what they do, just to give you a bit of a background, where this coming from, and then we're going to jump to the content. So please. Sure. So hi, everybody. It's an honor to be here. So thank you for inviting me. Pleasure. My name is Aditi Joshi. Um, I am at Google currently. Uh, I am the AI lead for our Google Cloud Security and Privacy Engineering Org. Um, I've been there for five years. I actually started out helping to run the privacy program um, at cloud. Um, but before that, I, I, have, I have a lot of work private sector experiences, but I think the one that I'm most proud of is my fellowship at Berkman at, at Harvard, where we actually really talked about um, data privacy research work. And I was just talking to Jonathan Zittrain, who runs the Berkman Center, one of the folks that runs the Berkman Center, about the fact that we were way ahead of our time um, many years ago. So I think it's finally catching up, and, and we're happy that that it's everything that we talked about before is now getting implemented into the workforce and is being really like assimilated into the curriculum at HBS and the different schools across um, the country. Very nice. Okay, uh, my name is Nick Lyons. I'm co-founder, co-CEO of Flawless. Uh, we're the uh, the world's first professional filmmaking tool company. Uh, we're based out of LA uh, and Santa Monica, LA Santa Monica and London Soho. Um, and you know the, the company was founded uh, with a vision that we wanted to be able to share global stories and the fact that most story is global, language is regional, and we think that there are amazing stories from all around the world that need to be shared. And hopefully in some way, in small, some small way, that contributes towards society in some way. Um, we, uh, yeah, we that's it really. <laughs> we do. <laughs> Yeah, Pl pleasure to be here, honor to be here. Thank you for having me. But my name is um, Simon Greenman. I uh, have a company called Best Practice AI, which I founded in 2018, which is a management consultancy focused on AI implementation across strategy, technology, and governance and responsibility. And the governance and responsibility thing really came out of, I had the good fortune to sit on the World Economic Forum's Global AI Council, which was the most senior multi-stakeholder body looking at how do we roll out AI for good, what are the appropriate guardrails that we need to put in place to make sure that AI is used responsibly across the world. Um, I've been involved in, in AI my whole life. I did a degree in it, and I don't want to date myself, but I will. Uh, the sort of late, <laughs> late 80s, early 90s, where I did my first neural network. And what was amazing is that neural network, I think, had 200 parameters versus 130 billion in chat GPT. But all of the supercomputer power in the 80s and the early 90s were less than what was in the iPhone. I mean, so we, we're living in a sort of magical world. I also got very lucky on the early days of the internet and helped start MapQuest, which was an early version of um, AI implementation rules. Very nice. So thank you all for, having, for being here. Um, so let's just start with thinking about really the topic of today. We're going to start talking about unintended consequences. And I think I'll tell you can you start talking about that, how you, those that you have manifest in the industry or the companies? Yeah, so I think it's really important that you're having an actual, just you're focused on unintended consequences. Because yes. I think when you're, when you talk about AI, you're really focused on technological advancements. And I think we get way um, into the rabbit hole with that. But I think the, the critical part is making sure that this part doesn't get sidelined. Um, I think some of the things that I've seen is job displacement. Um, with what's happening in the acceleration of, of AI, you're, starting, you're going to start seeing a lot of streamlining of operations within departments. And with that efficiency, there might be needs where certain job skills are no longer needed, right? So in that particular case, I think it's incumbent upon all of us to A, 
like make sure that we're, we're reskilling, um, especially um, it might be something like prompt engineering which is something that's unheard of and it's totally a relatively new field right now. So you have to reskill. Um, I saw a stat where every degree is actually outdated every seven years. So I feel like everyone should just go back to school all the time <laughs> or go to a sessions that the, the institute like this puts together, right? To be able to be able to be abreast of the latest and greatest that's happening. So I think job displacement is definitely an unintended consequence. I think it's incumbent upon many of the companies and the industry as a whole to be able to focus on strategic reskilling of their particular workforce, right? Because it has some serious economic impact Right, as to what happens um, to us as a country and as, as to the world uh, overall. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing I would say is just around data and privacy. So this is going back to like my research work at Yale and, and at Harvard. Um, I think privacy is incredibly important. Um, well, some of the work that we did was working with the State Department to protect the privacy of, of journalists, especially when they were in conflict areas like the Middle East, right? because you want to make sure that they are able to report out without any harm done unto them. Um, so again, that privacy and, and really preserving that data is incredibly important, which might be the unintended consequence um, of, a, of a, an algorithm, right? Because you're not aware of, of what, what it's going into it. So we need to make sure that we have the permission of the people to be able to use it. That's one thing. And then it's not just privacy. We talked about yesterday where privacy and security are two different things. Once you have that privacy um, in uh, those private, you've gotten the data uh, in, in, in a way that it's very consenting of that particular user you want to put cybersecurity measures around it. Um, so one of the things that we work on at Google is in the cybersecurity world. We acquired Nandian, which is the number one cybersecurity firm in the world, and they work on nation state breaches, um, those that have serious impact where nation states are attacking certain governments or big institutions like a financial institution. So in that particular case, you want to make sure that you are protecting all of that data, right? And that because it's when it comes to cybersecurity with hackers, um, especially with nation states, it's like a bank robbery. They don't just go in and rob a bank and run out. They actually kind of hang out, watch very carefully as to what's going on, like map out the network, see who's going in and out, who they can particularly target, right? So again, that security measures, the cybersecurity measures are incredibly important to put into place when you've amassed huge amounts of data, um, which is what uh, other these, these big LLMs have done, right? We just talked about ChatGPT and how much how big that model is, but making sure that there's security measures around it is incredibly important. Um, so that's that's the, the second part of it. I don't know, I don't want to take no, up all the time. No, no, exactly. <laughs> I want to hear from Simon because maybe you have more like the, the client and business side of it. Yeah. I mean, and putting it in context, one of the things about AI is it's been a story of hype and disappointment, you know, for for many many years here. But what's what's really interesting in the past year has I've never seen the sort of the speed of innovation adoption and the impact of technology before. And I think it is living in an unprecedented era. And for those of us who have been involved in AI for a long time, we've been hoping for AI to actually do something. And suddenly it's kind of like, oh, <laughs> I, can't, I won't say it, but it's oh, shit. We, we can say that here. Yeah. Um, and so now what we've got is, is there's almost a hysteria around a dystopian utopian narrative around AI and we've lost in some ways we've lost control of this narrative but you know going back to what are the risks and what I'm seeing in the applied side of things I, I, we at our company we look at three buckets of sort of risks and we've covered a lot of it here but the first bucket of risk is really sort of trust and integrity we've heard the LLMs hallucinate i.e. you can't rely on them for fact so you probably don't want to do a medical chat bot yet, right, yet, or give financial services advice based on the LLM. You could get in more trouble. You know, we've got bias and fairness. We've got disinformation coming out of this. And then we've covered our second bucket is a lot of issues around legality. What are the laws, EU, AI Act, GDPR, privacy, control, security, all of those things. So we've got a big bucket of risk there. And then the third one we sort of touched upon is the broader socioeconomic issues, concentration of power in big tech, especially US big tech, climate issues, um, job displacement and things like that. The clients, a, a couple of examples of sort of practical applied issues. Um, one of our clients is Hireview, US-based company that's the leader in AI-assisted recruitment. And AI recruitment is one of those high-risk use cases that everybody talks about, that it's, un it's biased, it's unfair. Under the EU AI Act, it's labeled as a high-risk case case. And it's called bias. But the reality is these algorithms are trade on historic data. So 
are they algorithms biased? No, well, not really. They're sort of reflecting our human biases. They've now got a mirror on it, and the risk is we're amplifying it. So in the case of Higher View, um, what we did the work with them is they wanted to be transparent and explain to the world why their algorithms were safe, they weren't biased, how they were using good governance practices internally around AI. So in that case, what we did with them is, is we actually published an explainability statement, which is, and we were talking about this yesterday, um, under GDPR, there are actually articles that says any automated, fully automated decisions with human impact actually have to be explained and you have to make them transparent. So I think it was James yesterday was saying, but doesn't regulation always lag innovation? Well, actually, there are rules in place that, that really are good examples of the practical things you need to do on explainability. So. Thank you. Uh, I think Great. Nick is going to show us something. Actually, I think, to be honest with you, it's probably better to just answer that verbally rather than right. sort of get stuck into things. Um, yeah, so uh, when it comes to unexpected, um, five years ago, having founded a company in AI in the visual space and um, predicting and explaining to people what was going to be possible, um, I think you know, there was a lot of scepticism, like, like Simon was saying. But you know, going along that journey, um, you know, we've all the way along, we've been really serious about artistic rights and artistic rights protection. Um, the unexpected, one of the unexpected part of that journey was uh, how do you fund a business when you have to do things, when you're doing things ethically and taking things seriously. You know, we literally had to take a completely different route for funding the business. Because if you like the traditional sort of funding mechanisms of kind of minimal viable product, do everything at a minimum, kind of show a certain amount of progress and then more investment will come. But actually building things properly, you know, like for example, we've built an artistic rights treasury, which you shortly I'll kind of show a few bits and pieces. But um, and this artistic rights treasury is a mechanism for basically being able to handle consent, compensation, and attribution, because obviously you can't actually handle consent and, and contribution and and, uh, and compensation unless you can actually understand the attribution within these models. So three years ago, you know, we went out and we built all of this technology, you know, outside of definitely the remit of what a standard investor would think. But now we sit here today and, you know, the unexpected component, like it actually turns out that that's actually a vital component for us to be able to actually monetize this, you know, so taking the kind of the right ethical and the right kind of protective uh, route has actually turned out to be the right commercial route as well. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, unexpected wise, um, I think, we film industry seems to be one of the industries that's getting affected sort of more before anyone else, or at least equally with, with other, certain other industries. And I think it's just a, a sign of, I think we're all acknowledging it's a sign of things to come in a very sort of broad spectrum. Um, but, you know, what we've sort of um, seen is that when it comes to sort of the data side of things, when it comes to basically like how much production costs are going to be reduced, um, you know, what this means for the film industry is we're probably looking within three years that we're going to be 30% of current production costs. Mm -hmm. And the mechanisms that are available now for visual and audio sort of manipulation are going to enable people to make the movie that they really wanted to make. So you're going to have a higher degree of commercial success from projects and you're going to have a massive reduction in physical production. So the reality is, is that like, there's going to be a huge influx of investment into that industry. So it's like a DT said, there's going to be you know, some retraining in certain areas. But if you take the film industry, for example, there's huge problems in the film industry in that physical production is incredibly expensive. It's carbon footprint. So it's carbon footprint. We, what we do is 0.01% of the carbon footprint of physical production. You know? So an industry is struggling because of basically that. Then those reductions, now okay, there's going to be probably some space in the physical aspect of like job losses, but there's retraining. And then actually it's going to be housing days for the film industry because the amount of investment, because there is no shortage of desire for good content. So actually we think there's going to be a huge amount of investment and then actually kind of boom time for the film industry. And it's, it's, that's unexpected because you know, people have a lot, I've heard a lot of people talking about, oh, well, you know, what will probably happen is, like, we're so convinced this is happening that we're kind of preparing for that world now. All right. And can, but so I can see that the AI is going to play a super important role, like reducing the cost of production for something everybody wants. What could go wrong? Mm -hmm. Well, I thought... Right, just to... 
I think that's a sub-segue. I think that everybody wanted to get to the chase. Yeah, 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 Rob. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, I think we've already... I was just expecting to do this at the beginning, so there's a couple of slides that probably um, we, I can just whiz through. So uh, let me just kind of quickly whiz through a short presentation. Yep, please. Yeah, OK. Because uh, I, I, I think everybody sh should think of, should understand what we're talking about. Yeah. I think yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be good yeah, to put some context. That's what I'm thinking, because yeah. we're a visual company. Usually, we put up a, like a yeah. clip of what we do at the beginning, and it kind of all makes sense. So yeah. Um, OK, so uh, I've already explained. My name's Nick Lyons. I'm co-founder and co-CEO of Flawless. Um, like, my background's in technology. I wrote a script. I ended up taking me to Hollywood. I met a very, an amazing film director called Scott Mann who had done some very big movies, and he had been made himself aware of what they now call Gen AI. Uh -huh. um, and collectively, we realised this was going to entirely change the film industry. And it's back to this component, like I was just saying, about production costs are high and uh, audience numbers are, re are reducing. I'm going to show you a little clip about where the science has currently got to. The tower in the middle of nowhere. And I don't blame you, and now we're stuck on this stupid stuck on this stupid freaking tower in the middle of freaking nowhere. And it's all my fault. Yes, it's all for my fault. Okay. Right. Do you want the context or not? <laughs> And yeah, we put that up because like, I think it's important that for people who kind of know the visual component, if you're looking at that, I mean, you've got hair and you've got a lot of different things there that are, you know, this is next generational stuff. And, you know, one of the things I'm going to show you shortly is some demonstrations of the software. Um, you know, there's get, we're the only people currently at Club who built scalable generative AI filmmaking tools. Um, and I know that today is about responsibility. And we know that basically what is currently going to be the, the preserve of the biggest studios, biggest streamers in the world very quickly ends up on phones, etc. And you know, we want to understand and make sure that things are being done responsibly. Um, just very quickly, the, the, you saw the two products there. The first product was TrueSync, and that has the ability to be able to, in the wild, under all conditions, uh, all head angles, we call it occlusion, so things going over the face, coffee mugs, etc., sunglasses, cigarettes, hair, whatever it might be, we've built the kind of version that's in the wild that can do things across entire movies. And you know, there's going to be some news about that as we go into 2024. So the second product we've got, and this is back to the, 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 produ the reduction in production costs, um, you know, we can do um, perfect lip syncing. So uh, filmmaking is a very iterative process and uh, pretty costly, as I've already explained. Um, and so quite often they have to go back to set. Now that's cast, crew, lighting, makeup, incredible carbon footprint. Um, and then you've got quite often movies are, are made on debt. So, you know, they're created on debt and then you've got a you missed your theatrical window. And except, anyway, the long story short is we can change what's being said in the lab and that gives more creative control um, and it gives, you know, back to the, the filmmakers uh, and obviously a huge reduction in costs. But, you know, I want to just basically show you a little bit of this software and you can start to see what's going to become available for uh, other people more and more. Well a version of the performance transfer tool that has some new features. It has the actual text that has been extracted from the audio of the script. So let me go ahead and play this scene. And after Dan died, I, I just didn't have the strength to be there for you, to be strong enough for you. So, so I ran away. All right, great. So first thing we want to do is we want to make a couple edits to this dialogue. Now in this version, we are actually allowing you to edit the script directly. Let me just show you that. So in this first line, she says, and after Dan died. And I wanna change that. I wanna change that to, and now I messed it all up. So what that is doing is it's taking that script that I've updated and it's actually generating an entirely new performance, both video and audio. Now I also want to change this last line here where she says, so I ran away. And we're going to say, I'm so sorry. Update the top 
timeline with that new information, and we'll go ahead and render this shot so we can play that. All right, now that I've rendered it, let's go ahead and see what we get. And now I messed it all up. I just didn't have the strength to be there for you, to be strong enough for you, so I am so sorry. All right, that's pretty cool. So we've synthetically generated both the audio to make it sound like, like the actress, as well as the video so that it's syncing up to those words. But now here's the controversial part. The actress never said those words. So I'm actually putting words into her mouth. In order to really use this ethically, we need to be able to get her consent. Okay, so I might appear that I set myself up for a fall coming on stage here and basically <laughs> putting something like this up. But um, like I say, right from day one, we've been taking the artistic rights piece very seriously, consent really seriously, compensation, etc. We have been in dialogue with uh, all of the guilds and the unions for quite a long time. Um, and, you know, as a result of those conversations, we realised that it's back to, kind of, already sort of half mentioned this, but we created the Artistic Rights Treasury, which, you know, um, is, uh, is a mechanism for us to be able to handle consent and compensation appropriately. Uh, when general models are involved, we can understand the tributation and we can understand weighting and we can make sure that a mechanism is in place to make sure that everything is being done correctly. And in line, for example, with legislation, but also in line with uh, any collective bargaining in any particular guild and union negotiations around the world. Um, the, um, I think the, um, the thing that comes back to data, data has been mentioned a lot. Um, you know, when it comes to performance data, artistic rights, um, what you're kind of seeing various clips of in the background behind me right now uh, is part of art. Um, it's a mechanism where we have an app that's connected to that, uh, to that system. Um, and in the situation where we're changing the, uh, the, the director and the talent have a very close relationship usually, and they will discuss new lines, and then there will be new lines performed, etc. and there's like, it's a collaborative process. So it's not, very, not entirely indifferent to be able to have a new line suggested to you. And in this situation, it was actually synthetic audio that was sent as well as, the, as, well, as, well as synthetic visual. Um, she's able to then receive that, approve that, if she likes it or doesn't like it, if she prefers to go back to set, well, that might not be an option, but if she prefers to go back to set or the original, that's a conversation, just as it would be between the director and that person. But it's happening real time, essentially, through an app. New audio can be recorded. Now, we're not using synthetic audio for clarity right now because we don't believe that it's been completely cleared as to um, how that should be handled, and we're waiting until that has been agreed um, predominantly by guilds and unions uh, in Hollywood right now. Um, but, you know, this is basically, once that thing has been approved, or a new audio, for example, has been sent via the app and sent back, that new audio can now generate a new visual. And, for example, in the, in the tools that we use, uh, we're, using, we're generating a model per character. So it is the idiosyncratic audio and visual performances that are being used to be able to generate the new kind of mouth movements, etc., new performance. Um, okay, that's, uh, that's it. I just want yeah. to give you kind of a demonstration so, of where we're at. Okay. <laughs> So now let's go to the hard questions, right? Because uh, we're talking about job displacement. I saw a lot of mouths open, as you were saying, the actor saying what she hadn't said before. You're talking also about, I mean, job search and many other applications. What guardrails should we start thinking about putting here? What? The, Sorry, what? The guardrails to how, to how do we actually contain the possible unintended consequences that we are From thinking sort about. of macro down, do you think? Yeah, I mean, when we looked at it, Try to look at the World Economic Forum. AI wasn't kind of hot like generative AI, and it's gone it's just gone nuts in the past year. But broadly, you know, it's a balance of conversation between that. There's a lot of opportunities for benefit for coming out of AI, and a lot of, and there's also negatives and getting that balance there. But the sorts of things we were doing at the World Economic Forum started with education. So how do we educate boards, C-suites, in the opportunity and challenges here? How do we educate around things like procurement? So for example, if you're sitting in your organization, how do you actually buy AI technologies? Um, how do you think about AI risk management and alike? So basically getting a sort of, we, we went through and put together these toolkits, guidelines, spent a lot of time on ed education around that, actually trialing these sorts of things. Um, you know, what we found in, in actual organizations about three or four years ago, there was, it, there was there wasn't that much receptivity 
actually to this. It's totally changed in the past year now because what you're seeing is if you get AI wrong, it can actually have an impact on your share price. So, I mean, help, help me out here, but Google, when they launched Alphabet earlier this year, their version of the large language model because OpenAI had done something, there was hysteria in the media, the stock price went bananas for a few days, that sort of thing. Or Chegg, the education company, when they, the CEO said, we don't really have, uh, we're being impacted by chat GPT and we don't really have a chat GPT strategy. The share price actually came down here. So what I, I'm saying is it's becoming real at the board and sort of sea levels at this point, which is providing a lot of momentum to actually put in place good governance frameworks within organizations at this point. My views on the what guard rights? Yeah, so for me, making sure transparency is, yeah. I think, incredibly important. Right, um, understanding what that AI is doing, uh, and this is from both sides, right? From the customer and the user perspective, you should be aware that you're giving your data for X, Y, and Z. That's incredibly important. And then the second part is even the developers who are working with these large language models, they need to be aware of, of what's happening behind the scenes. So I think this black box approach is definitely not the way to go. I think transparency is going to be very critical. Um, and accountability as well. It's making yeah. sure that these industries are being held accountable, right, for the, these large language models is important because when it comes to privacy and security, to go back to that, um, as a user, like we have, we are human beings, right? Our, we're giving our data um, and we entrust that it'll be used in the right way um, and that we're being informed of any changes that are being made done. I think that's incredibly important. And then putting those security uh, that overlay of security, that cybersecurity, making sure it doesn't fall into the wrong hands is incredibly important. One of the problems with open source LLMs, we were talking about this um, at the dinner after all the talks yesterday, um, these open source LLMs that are out there, I mean, that's fantastic, right? Because it, it, LLMs are getting commoditized, there's no doubt about that, but what if it falls in the wrong hands, right? And in the world that we live in, there are nation state actors that may be able to do a lot of harm um, with the use of these open source LLMs. So putting the security guardrails in place um, is going to be incredibly important and, and holding people accountable and <coughs> industries accountable for it. It's much of the same. Um, I think that sort of transparency 100% and I think there's like there's an element, I don't understand what you're talking about when you're talking about the black box and not allowing that as an excuse, right? But I think there's also like transparency in, you know, from the uh, company side, like predominant reason we created the artistic rights treasury was so you know we were we were able to be able to explain you know where a model came from mm. and if people then wanted to use that com for a commercial purpose it was obvious that we were going to have to have be explainable like my background previously was like you know Scott obviously came from the film industry and you know he explained to me like how sophisticated the um, the artistic rights, uh, the, the ecosystem for artistic rights in the film industry is probably the most sophisticated artis artistic rights ecosystem in the world. Um, you know, and rightly so with uh, the correctly powerful sort of guilds and unions protecting the artists. Um, you know, so from that side, we also knew that there needed to be a transparency on that side. And to be honest with you, it became in, it came just abundantly obvious that like that you know. There needed to be, you know, this mechanism to be able to understand, like, you know, within these models. That, for example, in our case, there's no such thing as a broad spectrum approach either, because LLMs are, you know, are a thing that's getting a lot of press. In our situation, you know, we're um, we're using single models, you know, for very rifle so rifle shot type approaches for solving very serious commercial problems in certain industries. Right, you know, but you know that. So in that situation, there's there's, there's less sort of governance needed over that. But then, that, mm -hmm. then, but there is because then you start to look at it through a different lens, and it's artistic rights protection. And then you start to have to understand. Good example, another another good example. It's not just about artistic rights; it's about commercial rights as well. And then having clarity on that because you know the biggest streamers and studios in the world have spent billions, probably trillions of dollars on on content. You know, certainly have spent trillions of dollars, but each one's probably spent trillions of dollars of content. Um, over the years, and they've created some of the most valuable data sets in the world for film, like, you know, and those just being used by other people to, in time, for example, create new film or new scene or new objects, and then other films being edited using those objects, etc. There's a mechanism that needs to be in place to protect that existing com those commercial rights as well as artistic rights, and we kind of come from that, that kind of angle. 
and we keep a very close eye on the legislation and make sure that we'll be compliant with that as well. I want to say you were. Yeah, yeah I, I wanted to add um, some of the, the, the practical stuff and the journeys that we see companies going through. Is, 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 so you see companies going from, let's get principles around the use of AI, let's get some policies and let's put it into practice. So you see a lot of companies starting with, what are the principles? Well, we want AI to be f explainable and transparent, as you're saying. Other principles, it's got to be fair. Um, other principles, it's got to be safe and reliable, that sort of thing. Somebody's got to be accountable. So a lot of organizations start off with that, then start putting it into what does that actually mean in practice and policy and putting it into practice. But some of the things where we've seen the journey work is you've got to have executive buy-in top down, like most things. If there, there isn't a senior sort of sponsor behind this, it's going to get lost in the weeds. It's very much a team sport. Um, so getting cross-functional representation here from the business side through the technology side and data side. So cross-functional team to help you put this together. And then there's a lot of education involved. What does it mean to have biased AI? Uh, it might seem an obvious question, but you have to educate there. And then putting get governance frameworks in, in place. For example, Deutsche Telekom, we did a case study on that. You know, they have four or 500 AI projects going on at any time. So they actually have an auditing um, department and there will be monthly sort of weed outs from different projects and stuff like that. And then I think you hit the nail on that, it's explainability. The, the fundamental is how do you build trust around AI and it's, it's trying to get under the hood, open the black box and explain how does this algorithm work. So those are some of the sort of the checklists that we see organizations going through on their journey. And I, you're nailing well like this is, this needs to happen yeah. for, the, for this to be protected and responsible. Who's responsible for making that happen? So there's roles of many, there's many players that could play an important role, regulation educators, companies. What is your views on that? So let's talk about governments too, right? As, as yep, regulators, absolutely. Right, as regulators, we have, they, they need to make sure that they're putting the frameworks in place, the right guidelines in place, and holding um, everyone accountable for building against that particular framework. I think that's really important. I think researchers are incredibly important. Institutes like this one, I mean, you're at the forefront of everything that's happening, right? You're sort of deciding what might the future five years from now look like. So really making sure that researchers are thinking about what can they do, what are the intended and unintended consequences are, is incredibly important because really, like, all the breakthrough work happens at the research level at universities like Harvard. Um, and then the third part is industries making sure the, these companies are being held accountable um, and that explainable AI is, is an incredible component of what they do, that it's as transparent as it possibly can be, that there's privacy and security measures that are put in place. So it's not one person or one individual or one, uh, like it's not the government's responsibility or, or the researchers or the um, companies, it's really interdependent, right? Everyone really needs to work together and it's a collaborative approach to make sure that, that we are um, doing the right thing. I agree entirely. It's, um, yeah, it's going to take everybody to, uh, to like collaborate in exactly that way. Um, you know, I, uh, it may come as a surprise, but not all CEOs have got the best interests of the general public at heart. <laughs> but, um, the, uh, I think that like, the reality is, though, that a lot of those CEOs, a lot of those founders um, can be held to account, and it's back to research. Um, my experience has been that you know the new rock stars of the, uh, the film industry in some ways are the, are the uh, AI scientists, and you know it, it, they can get a job anywhere, right? The people who are in that innovation layer, the people who are sort of breaking down boundaries, the people who have come to this university and a number of others, um, they're the people who you know they can actually be very powerful in holding the companies to account. So it's back to like, you know, the correct legislation, and again, I stress the correct re legislation that doesn't come in, that's not just basically, you know, set a forest fire to kill a tree kind of thing, you know, but it's actually sensitive to understand like how to allow this to move forward and for everyone to get the wider benefits, you know, globally, you know, without basically companies, like for example, being so restricted that they can't compete and they can't develop in the right kind of ways. But I think that like the, the researchers, like if companies, they they 100% know that if those companies are complying in the right kind of way and are behaving in an ethical and responsible manner. And to be honest with you, like, because they can get a job anywhere, they should leave those companies. And it should, no, it should be that simple in, in that context, in that particular relationship. You know, the research have an incredible power. Attracting people out of the best universities in the world is a challenge, mm -hmm. right? 
retaining them should be part of that challenge, should be basically like being held to account for how you operate. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that. Um, definitely there's, there's multiple stakeholders here, government, um, companies, academics, um, civil society. I mean, there was a recent Harris poll in the U.S. that 85% um, of the U.S. population says we should make AI safer. Now, it's not surprising because we've heard this sort of hysteria around existential risk from AI, but civil society, all of us as consumers have a role to play in holding um, companies to account on AI and holding government to account on AI. What, where I think it starts to get complex is the sort of the AI supply chain and who's accountable across that. And that there are, will be precedents if we think of complex supply chains like automobile, you know, how many suppliers are involved there and who's responsible along that supply chain. And we've got something similar, maybe not quite as complex going on with AI, but if we, we've talked a lot about the foundational model, this large language models, and they enable, they're huge enablers for unlimited number of use cases across <coughs> function industry. So then they, those LLMs, those foundational models, are being put into platforms and applications. Those applications are then being used for different use cases, and then they're being used, bought and used within organizations. So across that, who is actually responsible and accountable? And the law is trying to figure that one out at the moment. So for example, the New York City has a new law, which is an annual audit bias law for recruitment. Basically, if you're using recruitment software in your company, you've got to be audited to make sure it's fair and safe. But who's really getting audited there? Is the company using it? Is the application provider? Well, ultimately, it will be the large language model here. So we've got some big questions we still need to answer around responsibility and how we make that supply chain responsible. I'll just say one quick comment that I completely agree with. Like, who's doing the auditing? as well you know there's a, I think there's an important factor of basically like if people it's, it's very good to set certain frameworks in place I come from a regulated industry and from the inside watching the regulation from externally and what they were doing to regulate the industry it was farcical and you know so you know and anybody who was in, within the industry if they wanted to they would bypass certain things you know that's just a reality of the world that's how it works isn't it and so I think that we need to make sure that like the auditors also are basically capable of auditing what keeps you up at night on this? <laughs> it's, I mean... I mean, I was, my joke was going to be uh, my monthly burn rate, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not exactly applicable for this conversation. But um, I, I... In all honesty, there's nothing, nothing that actually keeps me up awake at night in that sort of context. I think that, like, as long as you... From our perspective, I think we feel like we're participating in the right kind of way. I think that from a personal perspective, I think that probably the same for most people is that if you felt that you weren't participating in the right productive, ethical, responsible ways, I think that would probably keep you up at night because I think you'd know, one, you'd probably be doing the wrong thing, but two, you'd probably know you're going to get caught. <laughs> no, I didn't mean on the guilt side. I meant on the what might be next in this space. Because yeah. you're talking about the role of a regulation companies, but understanding that there is going to be, it's, it's not easy. This is not easy going to happen. It's not that we're saying that, that we have to protect it. So we, I think we have the kind of the ideals of how this should be, right? Mm. But what, what worries you that might happen next if that's not possible? Yeah. So I'm, I'm here speaking for myself and the research work that I've done before, not for <laughs> Google, just to put that out there. Um, so I, I guess from that perspective, from a cybersecurity perspective, I think I'm really worried in terms of what's going to happen in the world that we live in and the global conflict that um, is just starting. Um, with, I, went, I, went, I go to hacker conferences all the time. One that we went, I went to was one in August um, in, in Las Vegas, and the White House was there. Um, they were there trying to figure out doing red teaming efforts to be able to break LLMs. Um, and mm -hmm. so I think there's some things to think about is the fact that it's not a human being that, like, as a cybersecurity person, you really think about how do you stay 10 steps ahead of a hacker? If you ever watch Catch Me If You Can, the Leonardo DiCaprio movie, right? You're always trying to figure out how do you stay 10 steps ahead of someone like that, right? Um, and how do you protect your particular company, your organization, the data that you have? Now, all of a sudden, it's no longer a human being that you're trying to stay 10 steps ahead of. You're trying to stay ahead of a large language model, an algorithm that's learning as it's going and it's evolving along the way. 
So now do you have to you have to come up with your counter AI, right? So you've got one AI going up against another AI. Um, and so that those are the challenges that I think really keep me up at night, especially with this concept of open source LLMs where the privacy and security hasn't really been thought through as much as it should have. And if it falls in the wrong hands, and I believe it already has, right? What's going to happen to us? Um, I think that's what keeps me up at night. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that. Um, well, there's sort of two levels I worry about. Um, and I was reminded this is the HBS school, not Kennedy school, when we were putting this panel together. But what's the, what's the impact on society and, and, and truth and trust in democracy? The risk from deep fakes, disinformation in the context of political campaigns, the fact that algorithms keep us in our bubble, how does that distort society? I think we're at a very dangerous point in society, and we'll see it play out in the election, I think, next year on, on a massive scale, and that worries me. So that's, uh, but, but the other side of it is I worry about the narrative is too focused on existential risk and not focused enough on the practical risks here and now. So, for example, the, in the UK next week, the, the Prime Minister kicking off the UK AI, uh, the, the Global AI Safety Summit. And he's, he's painted a picture of doomster here, how AI is going to sort of end up and the world's going to be a mess and there's huge risks. That's actually creating a climate of fear. And if you look at in the UK where I'm based, there's actually our adoption numbers of AI are very poor and weak here. And we've got huge problems in the UK around productivity, efficiency, and things like that. But if we put too much of this narrative of dystopian doomer narrative out there, it's slowing down adoption. And there was a CEO of a UK company called Graphcore, which chipped, and he said, look, the biggest existential risk from AI right now for the UK is not actually adopting safe AI and pausing it, because it's going to have such an impact on society, economics, and businesses and the like. Yeah, I think um, more broadly, I think that like the, the the powerful tools that are now in all contexts getting in the hands of everybody, yeah. um, I think that like has the ability potentially to amplify the current problems that we've got, um, and I think that like like you said, Simon, it's like we can think further and further and further, but like I think we're dealing with something here and now, where yeah. you know we've got incredibly powerful things in the hands of everybody, and what is that going to mean? Yeah. On these very positive notes. <laughs> no, I think it is important, right, to actually bring all the perspectives. I'm going to open to some questions in the room. We're also going to check the questions for those that uh, who are joining us in over the world. So let's start maybe with DJ. So thank, thank you for the great discussion. So Nick, I had a question for you. you know, uh, in, in, in the context of unintended consequences. So imagine I'm an actor, right, and I get the monetization part of it, the actor's rights and everything. You edit it, I give you the concept. And then later on I said, oh, it just affected my brand because if you would have used my real expression, I probably would have been here instead of here for a period of time. So do you see the possibility of someone coming back and suing in such a scenario? And then also how you evaluate your skills, like for example, Golden Globes Awards, you know? Do you think like there would be a separate category that says this is an AI generated or used movie and then it has to be treated separately then versus a real actor who has performed 100% on a particular movie? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the, um, the reality is, is that like, um, through this art app that's connected to this artistic rights treasury system, um, they're approving their audio and visual, uh, just visual at the moment. Again, it's, that's a work in progress. In the same way that on set, you've actually, quite often if you've seen it, but like the, the talent will you know, come around with the director and will watch on screen their performance. Now, that's essentially, in some ways, a, a collaborative acceptance uh, of you know, the performance and then before moving on to the next thing. It's obviously the director's responsibility to say, right, no, we're moving on now. I think we've got it, what we've got in the can. And you know, sometimes people might be you know, disappointed. I suspect that there is situations where they're disappointed that in the final movie what was cut in wasn't the thing that they felt was their best performance. And I think just the level of iteration that there is, and I think they just, so that's kind of the answer to that component. I think the second part is we've been, we, again, it's back to doing things properly. Um, you know, we started this five years ago, just over five years ago. And you know, we had to start 
working out like the word deepfake's been mentioned and like we're not we're, we're not working with two dimensional sort of face dropping technologies we had to go and you know which the the, uh, the the business have started with a paper from Jung who came out of Max Planck Institute and he was working in the 3D space and it was performance preservation was kind of the predominance of that paper and it was like a model per character so you know what you're actually doing is, is you're you know you're using the idiosyncratic style of that that particular performer to create something new, in this case, like new lip syncing, right? So um, we believe, and the, the, all the feedback that we're getting, and even Duncan Crabtree Island, who is the, um, he's the chief negotiator of SAG, Screen Actors Guild, who are in negotiations at the moment, you know, quoted us a week before the, the, uh, the, the strike started and said, you know, just want to just like quell everyone, like the, AI is not all bad, and I'd like to quote like flawless as a company, and he explained about the performance pres pres preservation, and he explained about the fact that as be it's a better localization mechanism than is currently available. If you consider, I mean, I know this is slightly adjacent because localization being slightly different to this editing component that you're talking about, but I think, um, I think you know, hopefully that answers your question. I'm going to take one from there, from the Zoom, to just make sure everybody has a voice here. So this one is a bit different in that sense, and because it asks about the percentage of the company revenue that is dedicated to your legal. So think about you know protecting yourself, uh, you and other. Because I think uh, maybe you have less of a view on that side, but I think you two will have a better view of, of the company. So yeah, the percentage of the company they get to the legal department to manage these risks, this litigation, and other matters that are related related to that. Okay. In your case, okay. you spend you can spend a lot less than you think you than you might do if you took a, if you take take the right approach. Yeah. If you're not trying to cheat people, yeah. if you're not trying to like cut around corners and you're not trying to trick people or steal the data, I tell you, you find it's an amazingly easy process. Well, no, that's wrong. It's a very hard process, but it's possible. Um, and that's, that, that's, that's the reality. I mean, we, you know, building a business like Flawless is an expensive endeavour. Um, but, you know, the legal side of it, we've had to have all the correct legal advice, etc., and lawyers from all different sort of like aspects of, uh, the, of the world. And, um, but working very closely with all the stakeholders, you know, we have been really close with all the ta you know, talent agents, the talent themselves, the guilds, the studios, streamers, all of the different people, even the media, you know, and finding out how to sort of thread the needle, yeah. as it were. And then, you know, of course, there's, um, there's the, back to the, the previous question is that, like, you know, if you do it collaboratively, and you make sure that you're treating it. And that artistic rights treasury was created to make sure that basically people feel comfortable and they've got control. Yep. But equally, without this, where's the film industry going to end? And actually, it's not just the film industry that's struggling from heavy carbon, massive costs, reducing revenues. So, being proactive and careful makes it cheaper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yes. Nothing so. to really add. To that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> very good. Let's open the questions too. I think there's a lot of conversations happening about enterprises and platforms and the how a, uh, LLMs are being trained and the data usage and privacy and things like that, which is all great. Um, but when it comes to unintended consequences, I think the more relevant analogy is probably social media. And if we thought about the unintended consequences of social media early, cyberbullying, suicide, misinformation, all of these things that happened, would we have treated it differently? And I think with AI, while Flawless is built for you know, studio quality, today I can do that same thing for about $20 with a short YouTube video. And think about if your child has a YouTube video that somebody creates a clone of and starts putting out their posts of things that they didn't say, gets them canceled, gets them what, yeah, I mean, cyberbullying goes a totally different way. And I'm curious, um, you know, how you feel about platform liability and things that maybe we got wrong with social media, are there ways that we can tackle this differently? Because these capabilities are, con are accessible to every consumer out there today, uh, and what they're going to do with them, I think, becomes the unintended consequences that probably are more relevant in the short term. <laughs> I'm just speaking for myself, so okay. I'll, I'll yeah. let you. Okay, yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, yeah, I think another really good question. and. Um, Again, I, it seems like I keep falling back on this, this artistic rights and doing things properly. And I think that, like you're right, and like I sort of said at the beginning, what is currently the preserve of the, the streamers and the studios and this, uh, you know, high quality component? Um, you certainly cannot do this um, for twenty dollars, um, you know. But this quality 
will, like with every technology, will basically start to proliferate. Um, we're working with Adobe um, on watermarking, um, and they've, I forget the name of the initiative, it's, uh, they, it's not easily remembered, but, um, we're, but we're working with other people around basically, so we, we don't want to create kind of standards for, for watermarking and believe that that should be something that is done across the board. Um, there are mechanisms that wants, that watermarking seems to be sort of partly the answer because you know you can have authenticity or not authenticity but then you have to ask the question of who's basically saying like what is right and what is wrong and then that's kind of another question that kind of it starts to sort of spiral I think that like from from, from our perspective is that you know we're not going to be letting this out until we feel like it's in, in more open sort of the general availability even for us is basically professional filmmakers and cost will be preclusive for a long time I would imagine for basically what I would call authentic, flawless, imperceptible quality. And I think that like what we're doing is like with a lot of these things is that like it's I think if you're participating, you're handling data correctly, you're respecting artistic rights, you're looking at things like watermarking, you're understanding how basically distribution and watermarking might kind of be able to handle mechanisms of being able to allow certain content to, to flow or not to flow and then allow other things to other components to evolve in the time that we've got. Um, I think that, like you know, we can we can protect ourselves. But yeah, social media. Who would have anticipated a lot of the things that happen socially as a result of the proliferation of social media? And you know, we do think about this. And like, we're spending time thinking about this. We're here, and we, we, you know, we like we like to think we take take a, a very solid part in the in research community in general, and like thinking about these things. And we're open to suggestion 100%, and we want to collaborate with everybody to make sure that in the time, which there is time, um, before this becomes a thing that many people have. Um, because I just refer back to currently what is available in AI editing software, which is off the shelf. You can tell very simply, very quickly. And if anything becomes anything other than lab conditions, in the, face, in the example of faces, straightforward, consistent lighting conditions, no occlusions, all those kind of things, to go beyond that is literally the difference between you have to build entirely new technologies and you have to it's the difference in difficulty and I don't need to tell this room but the difference in difficulty between here in the moon and here in the nearest galaxy so in the t that, so based on those, those that framework yeah I, I agree I mean try hygen Hi, uh, hygen is you know you a few dollars for tokens you don't need production quality to create a cyberbullying video and I think that's I, I think that's where the unintended consequences really are troublesome for me is when especially when social media and generative AI converge, yeah. um, and you know, it, and it definitely wouldn't happen on your platform <laughs> because it would be too expensive for somebody to use for that. But there are plenty of, of consumer-grade capabilities that, you know, we're already seeing videos being generated of politicians and, and other things happening. Yeah. It's we're on the verge of it, and I think I, I don't know the answer. I think education uh, is a big yeah. answer. I think educating parents on what generative AI is capable of so that they can watch out for their kids is critical. It's, it's a really tough thing to solve. I think the enterprise is easier to solve. I think what the consumers do with it is going to be scarier. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, the, there's a lot of regulation and questions to come around this. I mean, social media, we're, we're any, will we end up in a world where we don't know what truth is anymore in reality? Um, and, and, and that's a really big problem. So watermarking, does that, does that have to come? What does it mean in the political context? Do you need to actually watermark and label that this is a, is a generated ad? But there's a real risk of de destabilization, I think, around this. The other thing as well of what generative AI is really good at, and if you think of it, it is personal, hyper-personalization. Messages generated to you based on your interest. And the bubble goes from a lot of us sharing down to small and small, where it's a bubble of one to you. What is that? What's the unintended consequence of that for the world? I don't know yet. But it, it can't be good. Yeah, hyper manipulation, yeah. hyper personalized hyper. manipulation, absolutely. Yeah. There is the reality about Photoshop and Photoshop derived and how quickly the human brain adapts as well. And I think that, like, not mm. making excuses for, I, mean, I don't want to comment on other products that, you know, and, yeah. but um, the, the quality is not there. And I think that if anyone who's actually took a second look at that, the Hey Gen product, I'm it, but you mentioned it, but and there's a couple of others out there, and I think that if you take a second look at that, I think it's quite clear that it's basically generated. However, that will improve and whatnot, but you yeah, know, well, kids, kids are not looking at. I mean, they, you know, they're looking for something to to click on and to push out there. And I, I, anyway, it's pro not something we can solve here. But no, no, I, th I, I just think, think it's the point. Yeah. I, my point was going to be uh, more about, you know. 
think people look at the front of magazines these days in a different way they used to look at the front of magazines. Mm -hmm. And I think that we've become very quickly aware that Photoshop was able to do beautification and various other blemishy stuff that made people look impossibly beautiful, etc. And I think there's kind of not only will basically we work very hard on the technical side and on the regulatory side, I think there's also society has an ability, the brain is incredibly quick at learning basically like what to trust and what not to trust because that's how we've all managed to get here. And I think there's going to be a, a rapid movement on that side of things as well. Yeah. The eye is going to learn. Yeah, that's and I think that, like, you know, and, and then it will be quickly, you know, um, you know, that's just, it's already happening, isn't it? Fake news, fake, fake this, fake that, as dismissive, like, but, you know, probably for real stuff in certain situations. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cross. Uh, yes, uh, you're too, Maya. So, as Aditi has mentioned, so there must be a regulation framework down the line, whether how you, it has to be implemented <laughs> in the next five years down the line, how it looks. So my question is, because before deployment, so during the innovation phase, so if you are working on something, so how to easily find out like what to regulate and how to regulate. So those kind of decision, how it will be, because it has a long-term impact on your all the innovation you are doing. So how you, we can tackle that in a short span of time? Yeah, I think product development is completely changing. I used to teach product management in New York City for six years. Uh, and so the way that you actually develop a product and put that out there is, is moving faster and faster because before it was very deterministic and now it's more probabilistic, yeah. right? So there's that shift that's happening, that paradigm shift. So making sure that the regulators have put a framework in place and like holding industries accountable to adhering to those frameworks that have been put in place. I think NIST does a really good job. They've done a good job putting together the security framework, the privacy framework, and making sure that industries like companies are following those frameworks. I think it's really, really critical. And putting those, those um, like, putting the process in place to make sure that that's adhered to is going to be critical in this, in this probabilistic world versus the old deterministic world that we lived in before. Yeah, I, I really want to build on that important point is these model hours are prob probabilistic st and stochastic. And, and we heard yesterday from somebody who said, the problem with these large language models and things is you don't get reliable output out of it. And how do you know it's not hallucinating? How do you know what's true? And I think all of us who, who will be implementing this will very shortly be getting inundated with technical buzzwords as we try and work out how to make it more reliable. <laughs> so we're going to hear, all of us are going to hear things like, our techies are going to come and say, we've been playing around with embeddings, vector databases, fine tuning, and stuff like that. And then they're going to say, oh, we got it from 91% reliable up to 96% reliable. I'm doing this on a project. But all of us are going to be doing this before we know it and how we get from sort of probabilistic to more reliable in the midst of this. Very nice. Um, Taima, in the back. So, um, based on the themes um, in the last two days on ethics, <coughs> privacy, and regulation, can you raise your hand? Can you please raise your hand? Yeah. 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 So, based on the themes that we heard in the last two days on ethics, privacy, and regulation, I feel that a hospital system, I work at a cancer hospital in, in uh, Boston, uh, already has a framework uh, for the last 20 years. Uh, but the trade off with such a framework where you have an ethics board that you have to go through, where you have an ethicist in specific committees, you have, and this is the clinical side, not the research side, um, you have um, various um, uh, committees put together. The trade off is slow, right? We're infamous for being <coughs> in the back, catching up, but we, we have so many guardrails that it actually gives us a lot of confidence when we go out there. Um, so my, it's more of a comment that, you know, and, and, and one thing that I haven't heard is the culture. So in a hospital environment, the culture is very much top down, bottom up, sideways, privacy and ethics and patient safety. And, and I don't see a lot of culture mentioned in a lot of the kind of like the AI conversations we have had so far. Is that something that would be kind of like a component of kind of pushing us in this direction as a, as a society. Um, just want to hear your comments on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at that, but Hatim's talking later. NHS um, runs their cl clinical AI stuff and policy, so you're going to hopefully talk about that. Um, there's a couple, a couple of thoughts come to mind in terms of culture. You have to put the use of AI in the context of risk. Um, so obviously within a medical setting, 
it's a very high risk use case. So you do want to make sure you're going to be much more sensitive about putting the guardrails in place and being much slower about it. But the other the side of generative AI is what's really interesting about it is there are many situations where it would be wrong or it would make a mistake and it isn't high risk. So for example, in marketing, you know, it does a first draft of a brochure, that sort of thing. And it, the consequence of it getting wrong is, is not that high. In fact, it's helped me and I just edited that sort of thing. So I think you have to put it in the context of, of basically the risk, risk of the use case there. And as you say, culture, there's, there's many dimensions of culture. One of the challenges I've seen with generative AI is, is a lack of innovation culture in organizations and, and not actually trying it quickly enough, in, in my humble opinion. But yeah, I think it's, it's that sort of matrix of um, impact, risk there. And one thing to think about is just rapid development um, in a smaller setting, like a lab type setting, um, where you're running just two week sprints and putting out different proof of concepts and prototypes and just putting that out there in a smaller environment, a low risk environment, so that doctors and nurses um, and patients can give real time feedback and then you could iterate on that in the, on the, in the two week sprint process. That's something to think about from a culture perspective and doing that in a lab setting, that might be super helpful. Yeah. Very well, so we're gonna just, oh yeah, Steve wants to. I like the idea of the human intelligence regulating what's happening with the artificial intelligence. Are we seeing any emergence of groups that are responsibly creating new ways of uh, the artificial intelligence being used for good? <laughs> I, I, I think, do you have to make sure that you don't rely on AI too much, right? You always have to have a human in the mix of it all. Um, because at the end of the day, the emotional intelligence that we bring to the table, the empathy that we bring to the table, uh, the creativity that we bring to the table, I don't think they can ever be replaced by AI, at least not now. Mm. Um, it can be augmented by it. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a, it's a mix of the two. It's not to be overly dependent on it, but to I use it to augment what we're already doing and what the, the machine learning algorithms can do for us, the models can do for us. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, in some ways, I w wish it wasn't called artificial intelligence. Yeah. I wish it was called augmented intelligence in that way to use <laughs> because it, it sets it up as being in opposition to us and that creates fear. But I mean, one of the amazing things about, I think about generative AI and why it's had so much adoption is it's, it's almost a co-pilot. It's somebody that works with us. Now, that's anthropomorphizing, and an academic will tell me off. But, you know, all, for all of us, it's much easier to be a critic than a creator. And what's amazing about generative AI is you can ask it to do pretty much a first draft of anything. And that's the hard bit with a piece of paper. And then we can edit it and work with it. And it becomes a sort of co-creative process in all of this. And I think that's absolutely amazing. And it's also why I think a lot of people use generative AI, but they hide it from their bosses. Um, because it actually has amazing productivity improvements, and it has amazing quality impact. But, you don't want, but pe employees don't want to tell their bosses because it's almost like it's their secret uh, weapon over here. <laughs> Very nice on this note. <laughs> so I'm going to thank you again, our panelists. That was a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you.